Hey everybody, uh, thanks for coming, uh, making the hike up the stairs and I'm breathless both because of my excitement about the topic here and because it's a lot of stairs. Uh, but I'm also just really excited for this event. I think the idea of a copyleft conference is long overdue. Uh, we know and have known for a while that there's a lot of challenges um, that copyleft needs to try and tackle, possibly adapt to, and we just need more time to discuss and work through these things than occasional talks at other conferences about uh, licensing topics having this group of people here is really great. It's awesome to see such a turnout on the first year. Um, thanks to Conservancy for organizing it and for having me here. Uh, also, please remind me, uh, if you know me, please to never try to be funny again in my talk titles <laughs> by putting special characters in them. I spent at least 15 minutes to get those characters to appear in the title of my own slides. Uh, it broke the FSF uh, site. Um, the event posting, it uh, broke the email that we sent out about the event. Um, so, yeah, to, to Brett's credit and the Conservancy's credit, it did not break anything that I saw on the copyleft uh, comp site itself. So, kudos to them. Um, I gave a version of this talk back in the legal and policy dev room at FOSTEM in 2014, uh, but I thought this was a good opportunity to refresh it for a few reasons. Um, one is that the problems that I've talk, I was talking about back then have actually gotten substantially worse since then in the last uh, four or five years. Um, but also that the core questions um, that we're talking about here really do relate to copylefts and the future of copyleft. You know, how do copyleft requirements, traditional copyleft requirements, operate properly in a world of network services, uh, where which are a mix of locally run software on the user side and uh, uh, software communicating with it run on the server side. So, you know, our goal at the Free Software Foundation is to have all software be free software, uh, have everything that anybody wants to do on any computer be doable with free software. Copyleft is the best tool, legal tool, as well as sort of social uh, norm setting tool that we have in order to achieve that goal. And in many ways, we've made a lot of progress towards this goal. Uh, we've now endorsed multiple full laptop and desktop systems under our Respects for Freedom program where users can have, you know, for example, this laptop has a free boot firmware, runs a fully free operating system. We're pushing the proprietary stuff further and further out. There's still some things to solve with firmware on hard drives and uh, things like that, but we've made huge progress in that regard. Um, the problem is that users of these systems, even the certified systems or any other GNU Linux system, are actually still running non-free software you know, every day um, in the course of doing their computing. And Bradley and Karen actually highlighted this problem in their opening keynote at FOSDEM on Saturday, saying that free software browsers have become essentially the largest proprietary software delivery vehicles that there are. Uh, because any site that you go to, just about any site, is serving your proprietary software in the form of JavaScript as part of using it. So, made huge gains in one area, uh, and now have a different set of concerns to deal with. JavaScript programs, I'm gonna just make the assertion, which I'll explain uh, more as we talk here, but as they're distributed to the user, JavaScript programs are nearly always non-free. Uh, I think we can talk about sort of two categories of this. One is JavaScript programs that are intentionally non-free, and in that category, we can think of things like Google Analytics, uh, you know, Google Docs, uh, most of the files that are served from a Facebook or a Twitter, they don't, want that software to be free. It's intentionally proprietary. Um, but then there's a second category, which is JavaScript programs that are actually pulled in from, uh, say, upstream repositories or hosting where they are free software. Uh, but the way, even with those programs, the way in which they're served to the user from that site at that time um, is typically non-free. Typically makes them non-free software. Uh, second of all, JavaScript is essentially assumed everywhere on the web now. Um, I point to this moment in 2013 as a big uh, watershed moment for that when Firefox decided to bury the option to disable JavaScript from the, it's really not available on the user interface anymore. Uh, and that was just a big sign to me of how you know, much of a default for using the web it was now seen to be. They had, they had technical reasons for doing it. P people, including me, embarrassingly, submitted bug reports that a site didn't work because we forgot that we turned off JavaScript. Um, so you can understand that it caused them some headaches, but they felt that solving those headaches was you know, more important than uh, still providing the ability to disable JavaScript. But of course, we don't want to disable all JavaScript anyway. 
Uh, we don't have any problem with the Free Software Foundation, or I don't think in the Free Software Movement, with JavaScript itself. Uh, we have a problem with proprietary JavaScript. So these two things together create the JavaScript trap, the fact that most JavaScript is non-free and it's so ubiquitous. Uh, RMS called it the JavaScript trap in 2009, an article he wrote, and that was drawing from the previous article about Java, the Java trap. And that was back when Java was still under uh, non-free licenses. Um, people were writing free software that depended on it, and essentially they were you know, falling into a, a trap there. This trap hurts. Uh, we know better than to wait for proprietary software companies to do bad things to users. Um, but we don't have to wait. It's been happening in the world of JavaScript. On Kadoo.org, we've been building a nice list of all of the various shenanigans that have been happening. In the case of JavaScript, we can just run through a couple examples to kind of give this some context. Things that JavaScript can do include modifying your copy and paste buffer. So you might copy something from your browser, paste it into a terminal, and hit return before you realize that what you thought you copied turned into RMF-RF, um, and then you hit return before you realize what was happening. Uh, or you might see companies tacking ads on to your, your paste. You copy something from like a New York Times article and then you paste it in and suddenly there's a from the New York Times attached to the text that you copied. Uh, it can block browser functions like saving images, sort of the cheapest and most ineffective form of DRM that I know of. <laughs> uh, can record your keystrokes. Uh, a lot of people are really surprised by this one, but you know Facebook was called out for doing this of recording status updates even if the user didn't actually ever hit return. Uh, just read a story the other day about customer service companies, those chatbot windows or chat person windows are recording and showing the things as you're typing to the other person. So be polite even before you hit return. <laughs> it can deliver various kinds of malware. Um, there was a, just this one random example, an exploit, exploit against the Tor network that was delivered via JavaScript. And of course, uh, Spectre Meltdown more recently um, was also exploited via JavaScript. So, you know, part of why I highlight these things is that uh, these happen within, the malware case is a little bit different, but uh, these generally happen within the sandbox that browsers provide for JavaScript that is supposed to limit the capabilities that, that it can do in order to protect user security. Um, that's not enough for the same reason that sandboxing proprietary software in general is not enough. Uh, just because something's running a sandbox doesn't mean you don't have the right or need to see what it's doing. And that's you know, backed up by the fact that you don't necessarily agree with the parameters of the sandbox all the time. Um, and the sandbox doesn't stop intentional exploits. You know, sandbox can be exploited. But it's not just about avoiding the proprietary JavaScript. It's also about embracing the free JavaScript and getting, you know, we've had amazing things happen in the world of free software um, centered around the collaboration that CopyLeft creates. And we can have that same thing potentially with JavaScript. And we see some of that now. There's a, you know, people might remember Grease Monkey, I think, is where this all started, an extension that allows you to replace the JavaScript that was uh, offered from a site with your own local copies. Modified versions are entirely different things. Um, now there's several repositories like this. Open User JS is one where you can download uh, custom scripts that are do different things for different sites, make them behave in ways you might prefer. Uh, and that leads us just down a really interesting road. It might change the whole dynamic of network services if you know, imagine sort of constructive collaboration between users and server operators and then uh, those things being shared between users and in communities the same way as uh, uh, other forms of free software have been. Other nice thing about uh, this site is they seem to be doing a, a pretty, I didn't look super thoroughly, but they are making an effort to have everything labeled with licenses. And the default license is a lax permissive license, but still a free software license. And a quick search did show that some people were using the GPL including GPL3 for some of the JavaScript that's hosted there. So this is kind of a, a step towards the, the world that I'm talking about. So what do we need to make JavaScript uh, more JavaScript-free software? Well, two most important requirements. Provide a license notice. If you don't provide a license notice, then by default the software is proprietary. Um, and possibly a copy of the free license. We have to talk about you know, how that fits in, but we've uh, you have to tell users what their rights are in order for them to know that it's free software. Licenses require that specifically. And of course, you have to have the source code. If you don't have the source code, it's not free software. You can't exercise, uh, you know, these, you can't exercise the four freedoms if you don't have access to the source code. So even if someone says something is free software, you don't have the source code, it's not. So how do you do these two things? Uh, by the way, these are not, these are copyleft requirements for sure, but this is not just an issue for copyleft licensed JavaScript. 
How many times have you seen um, this sentence, or well, the MIT license, the expat license says, the above copyright notice and this permission notice shall be included in all copies of, uh, or substantial portions of the software. How many minified JavaScript files have you seen with that notice in them? Right, not, not very many. So we're, I'm focusing on copyleft, but it's not just copyleft's issue. It's an issue with JavaScript uh, delivery, you know, the, the culture around how that's done and the, uh, the standard practices. So it's kind of bandwidth versus freedom. Um, you know, JavaScript is really focused on, the, the web in general is focused on speed, things happening fast, uh, minimizing bandwidth usage because that costs money. Uh, and so, of course, you're not getting a full copy of the GPL every time you uh, get a JavaScript file served to your browser, and uh, you're not even getting real source code. You can click and you can see what JavaScript you were given, but it'll usually look like this, additionally obfuscated by the projector conditions here. But um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> variable names are reduced to one letter. Function names are reduced. Uh, this is not the preferred form of modification. Someone wrote a program, they piped it through another program, spits out something which is essentially compiled like a binary uh, in C or, or another programming language. So this is not source code. Uh, so what do we need to do uh, in order to address these issues, those two things? license information and corresponding source code. Uh, I have some, some suggestions that the FSF has been advocating for for a while now for addressing these problems. Uh, and the suggestions are driven by two goals. One is to be machine readable, uh, because when you visit any site, you're going to get you know, possibly a dozen more individual JavaScript files served. Um, even if they each have a license notice, you got you to care a lot right, to go through and like, look at each one of those and, and see what's happening. Um, so we want automated tools that can detect licenses and, and let users know what they're being asked to run. Um, but they still do have to be, uh, whatever we do also still does have to be human readable because um, it is in the end the humans that need to know their own rights. And that's kind of a fundamental principle that's helped lead free software to where it is today. Uh, is not just a kind of legalistic copyright notice, but an actual statement that says this means you, know, you have the freedom to copy, redistribute, modify, et cetera. So the first way um, of doing this is in a minified file, and I know, I'll get to the, the obvious problem with this in a second, but uh, in a minified file, you can provide a link to the corresponding source code in the minified version, just in a stylized comment using a consistent format like so, source with a URL for the source code. And then you continue in that comment to provide the license notice, um, like this example, typical GPL notice that you might find in other kinds of source files. If you're the copyright holder on the JavaScript, you, know, you have to deal with this, providing a copy of the license issue. If you're the copyright holder, you could consider using an additional permission for the GPL, um, GPL v3, which says that uh, you may distribute non-source, like minimized or compacted forms of that code without a copy of the GPL, um, provided you include this license notice and a URL to the corresponding source code. But, of course, you are probably um, not the copyright holder. So instead, we offer a set of magnet links for uh, most popular free software licenses, most widely used ones. And you can include instead uh, a comment like this, which has a magnet link to um, the license that's, that's the right one for the file. And that will take users to the, the right license. The idea being that magnet links have more durability, long-term stability than a single URL on a host that, that may go down at any time. So obviously, that's a lot of stuff to put in your minified file that you just spent a lot of work to crunch. Um, and I'm guessing not the most popular solution. We think that there's a better way to do it. Um, the comments can help for individual files, but if you have a, a site that serves multiple JavaScript files, you probably want to use JavaScript web labels. Um, this is a system that pulls together, aggregates the information about all of the JavaScript that's served from a site, and you essentially build a manifest. Um, you have that viewable and human readable on the site, uh, and also following a certain structured format so that automated tools um, can find and parse it. So uh, 
there's some URLs here for where these things are described and announced. Um, if you just go to fsf.org and click campaigns, you'll see the JavaScript campaign and you can follow through and, and find all the relevant resources from there as well. Um, and it's our position that if you follow these recommendations, you will be doing your job of complying with those key provisions of the GNU family of licenses, GPL, AGPL, and so on. So the format starts with providing a link in the footer of your site. Uh, it says JavaScript licenses. That's the human readable part of it. Be clear about what it's supposed to point to. Uh, and that link has an ID, uh, sorry, a rel attribute, which says JS license. Um, that is in order for, that's to help the, the tooling uh, locate the web labels page. So you want to have that on each page that has JavaScript on the site. Putting it in the standard site footer is usually the way to do that. When users click that link, they come to the web labels page. Okay, and the web labels page on your site, on the left side has the JavaScript file name, usually the minified version. In the middle, it has the license, the link to the license, um, as well as the name for the license. And in the right-hand column, the complete the corresponding source code. In the HTML, that looks like this. Uh, the table has an ID, JS license labels. Uh, in order to, again, communicate with the tools. And then the rest is just a standard HTML table. Uh, we do have some people that have been adopting this format. Um, i just like to highlight one example, which is EFF. Uh, this is the site before their redesign, but I, I did check, and they do have um, a new web, lab, web labels page since they've done the site redesign. And in fact, I noticed it was really cool. They're actually doing a lot of their JavaScript under AGPL, which I think is a very good and appropriate idea. Um, so we are getting some, you know, some traction uh, with this. But I'll talk more about that challenge in a minute. Um, and then the last component of this is, I keep mentioning the tools, what tools are there. So we provide one, which is GNU Libre.js. And this is a browser plugin for Mozilla-based browsers that um, will look for this web labels page and will also look for the stylized comments in the files and will then block any JavaScript that is unlicensed and therefore proprietary. Uh, and will allow through any JavaScript that has a license it knows to be free. Um, so this is uh, allowing users to be more refined rather than just block all JavaScript. Uh, allows them to accomplish that goal of allowing the free JavaScript through and just blocking the proprietary. Um, that's one way of doing it, two ways of doing it actually. Why didn't we do it some other way? Uh, well, we're not opposed to another way, um, but we also didn't want to wait this is a problem that was bad enough in 2012 when we started tackling this issue, and it's only gotten worse since then. So uh, we are open to other ideas, certainly. GNU Libre.js could be extended to recognize other ways of labeling JavaScript licensing. Um, but the point was just not to wait. You know, let's get something out there. Let's get people starting to use it and recognize the problem and build on things from there. Some other ideas have been mentioned include things like HTTP headers, uh, adding attributes to the script element itself. Um, in HTML to specify the license. Uh, people sometimes have suggested RDF approaches. Uh, I've been looking at JavaScript source maps as a very interesting thing that, that connects minified JavaScript to the corresponding source for that. There was an exciting announcement by the Ruby on Rails project last week saying that they're going to turn source maps on by <laughs> default. So all the minified JavaScript that they're shipping will link to the, the source form. Um, the challenge is I don't know what support for any kind of license information is in there yet. We're going to be taking a look at that. But it's a step in the right direction of recognizing the idea that users should be receiving the source code. And uh, developers who want to build on that um, will have much greater capability to you know, um, look at what's going on under the hood. So I said 2012. Uh, how have things been going since then? I, I would have to say not good. Um, so. You know, why? Well, you know, part of it's our fault. Right? Part of it was uh, Libre.js wasn't you know, really working that well for, for a stretch. And without that, that tool, it was really difficult to get people to adopt the system. Because for one thing, you couldn't verify that they had done it right. Uh, you didn't have the automated tool to do that. And also, users weren't really, uh, not that many users were using it. So there wasn't creating much demand for people to put their time into it. Uh, what I mean when I said it wasn't working very well is performance issues. You know, it has to load and parse all the JavaScript from a site that takes time, slows things down. Um, there were just some outright bugs. Uh, it wasn't recognizing licenses that it should have. You know, there were, there were some issues. And, and people worked really hard at it uh, and did make some progress. 
Um, and then Mozilla changed the extension interface. And so LibreJS had to be uh, reworked in order to accommodate the new interface for um, all extensions. So the good news is that these issues are being addressed. In fact, they were recently largely addressed. If you try LibreJS in the past, um, I encourage you to try it again. It was uh, reworked by the author of NoScript, in fact, um, and now performs quite well and is giving a much better foundation for, for the, both the campaign and the technical work that needs to be done to, be, uh, to build on. Unfortunately, now uh, Chrome is pursuing changes to the extension interface that will make what LibreJS does essentially impossible because extensions will be not allowed to modify the content of uh, pages. So um, this is also a problem for NoScript and a problem for lots of other plugins. So how do we get better and how do we you know, get things on a better track than what they have been in the past? Uh, well, one, there's a list of things that need to happen on the technical and software side. Um, I just mentioned no scripts, but I just want to uh, highlight that as uh, an option if you ever find that LibreJS is not working for you. You can always fall back on no script and it's going to block all the JavaScript, uh, but it works really well. And uh, in a world where not that many people have adopted web labels yet, it's a good tool to use in the transition anyway, uh, given that the vast majority of JavaScript is non-free. Uh, LibreJS improvements, like I said, a bunch of them just happened. They'll continue to happen. Uh, LibreJS for mobile devices, since the primary way that people are browsing, browsing the web now is on their mobile device, the plugin needs to work on the mobile device. Uh, and we do have that in the works. Um, I'm hoping that that will be done. I'm not going to put a timeline on it, but it's happening right now. Uh, LibreJS for Android. So you'll be able to use that in Android-based versions of uh, any Mozilla browser, uh, I think any Mozilla browser, but for sure IceCat, uh, Firefox, Fennec. After that, uh, we really want to pursue a command line automated testing version. Uh, if any of you run uh, sites or are responsible for that as, as part of your work or, or hobby, you know that uh, if you upgrade something, it changes. And so you need a tool that checks to make sure that the way you thought it was working is still the way you think it was working. Uh, this is an issue for us at the FSF. We use platforms from upstream like Drupal, MediaWiki, uh, and we find, we've have found in the past that we've done an upgrade and uh, the web labels now started failing for particular pages. So we went away to make sure that we can run a tool that checks against the site and reports, um, just like you might use a broken link checker or something like that when you've fallen out of compliance with the format. And this is also just very handy for that phase. We had, you know, we had a lot of organizations trying to work with us to get the format done properly on their site. And it was it's just cumbersome to have to browse each individual page um, in your browser and see what it does, right? A tool that you can run as part of a script during the active development of the system on the site, really helpful. Uh, the JavaScript tool chain, the, the tools that people typically use to minify the JavaScript, um, I think can be improved and modified to make these options accurate licensing, in, uh, accurate licensing information formatted in, in clear ways, just the defaults, um, which will make life a lot easier for JavaScript developers and users alike. And uh, also getting, you know, contributing patches to upstream free software projects that are popular and use a lot of JavaScript. We've done a bit of this at the FSF. I think we've contributed some patches to Etherpad, um, other platforms that we use in order to get the license notices uh, upstream, and then it benefits us and everybody else too. Um, identified these as nice starter bugs. I, I know, I think it was Tom Marble told me a story about helping someone get started in free software by having them update the FSF's address in various GPL source files from the old Temple Place address to the current Franklin Street address. <laughs> it's a simple you know, bug to fix and a good way to get um, familiar with the bug tracker, version control system, other dynamics of being a contributor in a project. Well, why not you know, uh, do that same thing with adding uh, license notices and clarifying things in a JavaScript project? Uh, we also have on our radar the possibility of using SPDX identifiers. Uh, if you're familiar with that project, it, uh, has similar goals of creating both machine and human readable identifiers for licenses. Um, and we've worked with them a bit in the, uh, over the last couple of years to um, get that to a place where we feel like we could recommend that and use it in other projects. And this project, LibreJS, and the web label system needs a way to identify particular licenses in a way that's machine readable. So that seems like a natural possible uh, matchup. We need some awareness campaigns. Now that we have better tooling and are going to get better tooling, we can get back to doing this more uh, politely, constructively, diplomatically, talking to sites that you 
uh, you know, there's the low hanging fruit of sites that are probably friendly to free software already and willing to put in a little bit of work to clarify things and make them work properly. Um, a lot of, you know, this is a problem that just people aren't aware of. The, the JavaScript loads in the background, people don't think about it. And so we don't want to approach it from a hostile, aggressive position. We want to approach it from a, hey, there's a problem, here's how you can fix it, uh, and offer help whenever possible. And use CopyLeft for your JavaScript. Uh, I'm hoping that um, more people will start doing that with these sort of conundrums addressed. I, I know that a lot of developers didn't initially choose JavaScript because how do you provide a copy of a license? How do you provide the source code? So with ways of doing that now much clearer, um, I hope that maybe we can see uh, a greater use of CopyLeft in the JavaScript community, which is, I think, everybody would agree, even without reproducible hard data, has uh, leaned more towards the permissive uh, licensing direction. And my random pro tip of the day, uh, we do this in our staff meetings of sharing a random tech tip. Uh, if a site is not, if you have NoScript on or LibreJS and a site's not working without the JavaScript, try a text-based browser like W3M or Lynx. Um, because of this, the browser sniffing that sites do, if they think you have Firefox or Chromium, they're gonna keep just trying to stuff JavaScript down your throat. Um, if you fire up a browser from like the you know, early 90s, uh, it will actually make the site work. So, works for me all the time. Uh, so, thank you, everybody. Um, and thanks again to the conference for putting all of this together. Maybe we have a few minutes to ask some questions and talk about the issues. Um, I'm just going to highlight there is a, we have a JavaScript uh, task force um, that we have, we're trying to sort of build a group of people who have expertise in JavaScript development and are interested in this. Uh, if you want to join that, just email campaigns at fsf.org. We try to you know, keep the signal high, noise low, and, and focus on a conversation among experts about uh, how we can best advance these, this work. Uh, and also to possibly be willing to volunteer for sites that say, hey, I want to do this, but I'm having some problems. Um, hopefully we can get a volunteer from this list to go uh, dialogue with them and work through it. Just go ahead and ask a question if you can repeat it from the stream. Okay. Uh, is there any effort to look at like the top websites and see what JavaScript could simply be rewritten? Uh, or not rewritten, but you know, like we, we, we write alternative versions of yeah. normal programs and uh, you know, under free licenses, is there, not, is there maybe something that could be done along those lines because I have a hard time imagining that we're going to be very convincing, you know, with a lot of the <coughs> websites out there that yeah. we know everybody's using. So, I mean, if I can summarize the question, paraphrase, the question is, uh, is there any effort to uh, develop workarounds in cases where on top and popular sites uh, they won't work without JavaScript and they're not going to adopt web labels anytime soon? Um, without proprietary JavaScript, they're not going to adopt web labels anytime soon. Uh, yes. So actually, uh, Ian, one of our systems at the FSF, uh, worked with an intern um, at the FSF recently to develop one example of that, which is a program that can be run to make donations or payments through PayPal without running the proprietary JavaScript required by PayPal. Um, and we are going to start looking at other things like that. Uh, we're going to start with ourselves, and we're going to start with some tools that, um, for sites that we need to use at the FSF. Uh, but we'll publish that, and we'll, you know, we'll start trying to build some momentum behind that effort. Obviously, you know, the, the movement's been in this situation many times before, right? Chasing, developing replacements for stuff. Uh, we want to get ahead of it, but we also do need to make it possible to live as freely as possible now. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. <coughs> Question? Um, I, <clears throat> I'm a lawyer, and from this perspective, it's really hard to convince clients to deal with this. Because <coughs> they all know in the, in the internet of things world, there could come McCarty and, and others who make real claims in the real world. But it, it seems to me, when, when I um, discuss this with, with a client, they, they, they are like, well, this, this, this never come across me in real life. This, this does not happen. No one will sue me, so why should I do anything? A at least in a situation where from 100 websites, 99% does not Anything like this. Yeah. Okay. So again, to, to paraphrase the question, it's sort of from a lawyer's perspective, working with clients, uh, 
there's a reaction the clients uh, aren't sure why they should care because this is such a prevalent practice for one thing, everybody's doing it. Um, and they uh, also, I think I heard, don't want to be at risk for possible GPL enforcement against them if they're not properly complying. Uh, I mean, to tackle the second one first seems more straightforward. They're, if they're using any free software JavaScript, I mean, that they received as free software from upstream, they are, there's a good chance they're already violating the, the, the license, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so I think the first question is the, the real daunting one, which is um, you have to get the culture to a certain tipping point where people feel like they're going with the flow rather than uh, putting in work that their competitors don't have to put in. You know, what we can do with help, what we can do to help with that is, so for, I think free software is still sort of largely owns the JavaScript world, right? I mean, like the popular JavaScript frameworks are free software. Uh, and companies, you know, Facebook, Twitter are publishing JavaScript frameworks as free software. So if we start there and get those uh, labeled and the license notices in place, that's gonna get downstream and make a huge difference right off the bat. And then after that, we, it's just a typical campaign type advocacy strategy. You know, we have to pick some more high profile targets, uh, both in positive and negative senses probably, and you know, celebrate people that are doing the right thing and then put pressure on people that are uh, being obstinate about it. Governments is one we might focus on because uh, the uh, Copyright Office in the US is now requiring proprietary JavaScript. Oh, it's another example of what Chris was talking about. We also developed a tool to allow uh, organizations to register as under DMCA safe harbor provisions in the US without having to run the proprietary JavaScript that the Copyright Office's uh, online registration system requires. So, uh, yeah, because governments are an ethical, clear ethical issue for people, so we can target them and try to get the right thing done there. And then hopefully for clients like what you're working with, that becomes Either they receive it already done from upstream, or it's more clearly a norm, right? That would be very helpful yeah. to be Hopefully, uh, copyleft, in terms of the enforcement worries about the GPL or anything else, hopefully that's being discussed more in other uh, talks here, but I'll just refer people to the principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement, which the FSF and Conservancy follow in order to address fears about you know, individuals possibly trying to shake down companies that are violating the GPL. Is that time? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, oh, one more. Sorry. One more thing. One more thing. I just wanted to, to say that by giving this talk, uh, a version of this talk before, that I had people come up and like want to join this effort to develop new extensions and help this work with some of the tool chain. So there's momentum building behind this. If you want to help, please let me know. Okay. Thanks.